This is episode 69 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today's topic is one that I believe most, if not all women, can relate to. And this is the experience of exercise resistance. This is what happens when you know on a logical or rational level that exercise is good for you and you have every intention of being healthier and beginning to exercise. And for whatever reason, something blocks you from following through. My guest today is Francie White, who has a 35-year history as an expert in the field of eating, exercise, and body image disorders, both as a theorist and a practitioner. She is the co-founder of the Central Coast Treatment Center in San Luis Obispo and surrounding areas, where she recently created a brand new treatment program for binge eating disorder and related overeating problems. In 1985, Francie began a large private practice with a physician in Santa Barbara, California. And at that time, little was understood about disorders involving eating, exercise, and body image issues from a psychological, medical, or nutritional standpoint. Francie also teamed up with best-selling author Janine Roth and had the privilege of leading thousands of overeaters through breaking free from emotional eating workshops inspiring Francie to create her own theories on overeating and eventually on exercise resistance syndrome. Francie also published the first description of exercise resistance syndrome in Women's Health Issues Journal in 1996 and has continued to treat women and train professionals using her specific process and formula for treatment. In today's episode, Francie is going to talk to us about what exercise resistance syndrome is and why it matters. She will also share some of the first steps when recovering from exercise resistance syndrome. Hi, Francie, and welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. This is great. Thank you very much. I am so excited about our conversation because I first learned about you and your work when I was watching a video that you did with Dr. Anita Johnston, who, you know, is, is an expert and has done very rich work around the area of disordered eating. And she was on the podcast recently to talk about her book, Eating by the Light of the Moon. And I think it was maybe a week or two later in one of her newsletters, she featured a short video with you where you spoke about exercise resistance syndrome. And I had never heard of this. So, you know, Francie, just to get started, I, I love giving our listeners some background before we get to the actual, you know, meat of the topic. Can you share how you were drawn to this area? Well, yes, I got my, my first degrees in health science, bachelor's and master's in nutrition. And then I found out I had to be a dietitian to practice nutrition. So I became an RD as well. And I had a great background and I thought I was going to get into the field of health and wellness back in the mid 80s, early to mid 80s, and just help people make great health decisions and, you know, learn a lot about nutrition science. Well, that was a time in which nutrition was, was really changing from something that provided, you know, real science-based information to an image conscious sort of pathway. Like I'm organic or I'm, you know, whatever, you know, vegan or, or paleo. So people began right away wanting diets and dietitians then, including myself, were not trained in the psychology of eating. And so I wandered in through a door, got into a big practice with a physician. And the next thing I know, it was 1985, and we were treating a huge number of women and men who wanted to lose weight. And so they wanted an exercise program, and I had a background in exercise physiology, so I was handing out all kinds of supposed wisdom and running these groups, running this program, when 
all of a sudden, someone had the guts to raise their hand and just let me know from one of the workshops I was giving, you're not really helping me with, (laughs) no offense, (laughs) Wow, with the kind of eating I'm doing. Or the kind of problems. I, and I, I remember putting my, my chalk down and looking out and just saying, you know, say more, please. Yeah. And she said, you know, she described a ritual of binging, which I honestly cannot believe I'm saying this, but it's true. I had never heard of. Our family had, you know, plenty of problems, alcohol, drugs, but eating, overeating wasn't one of them. And so I remember sitting down with with the with the participants saying, tell me more. I'm obviously more the problem here than I am helping you. And long story short, this wonderful group just kind of guided me through what binging was about, what it was like. And it became hilariously obvious, kind of sadly hilarious, that I was very much part of the problem. Wow. And at that point, right, they introduced me to Janine Roth, who had just written Feeding the Hungry Heart, describing kind of like memoir, like almost what it's like to struggle with overeating, weight, dieting. And I called her up on the phone and had her come out to this large practice and do a workshop for my women. And that began a, com- you know, a camaraderie of of really helping women and men learn how to turn inside themselves toward their own bodies in search of hunger signals, satiety signals, and turning toward their own inner lives, their own hearts, their own psychology for what was driving eating outside the bounds of hunger and satiety. So I began to specialize in overeating disorders within a matter of a few years. So it's really like there are external factors that lead a person to really get focused even more on the solution being external. Right. For example, I know you mentioned, you know, in something that you shared with me prior to our conversation about the role of culture. Yes. And the, and you also just now shared too how, you know, with with good intentions for many people involved in the, you know, in this industry of helping people to be healthier, you can inadvertently not be helpful. So it's interesting that, you know, all of these, you, you look at the external things that are happening, but really it's the the way to move through this is an internal process. Right. And, you know, without dietitians, it, you know, nutritionists don't necessarily have the psychological training and background, which I ended up getting to move the the emphasis from outside in externalized to inside out Mm. it was through my own real failure actually at making my clients better despite all the magic i could try to come up with with diets and exercise plans what we discovered was some of what the intuitive eating health at every size solutions were for eating or and are and that is that you know people really do have a basis of knowing that is programmed in through thousands of years of evolution. And we did learn, and most people know now, that diets backfire because they create a pent-up backlash, a spring-loaded drive to, to eat and overeat and to eventually binge. And so... Well, once I realized and and began to teach the intuitive eating approach and help people find their own wisdom and find the ancient source of really embodied eating, mindful eating, that, that they could then kind of ferret out what, what part of their eating diets and admonitions about how to eat and what to eat and where to eat how that created a backlash. They could ferret that out from the true emotional overeating that really needed a different kind of attention. And so it suddenly occurred to me that with exercise, my my female clients were, you know, heading out to the gym and we got, I got them all worked up with all the new physiology, exercise physiology to inspire them and we set up a plan. And of course, in a matter of months, it would be 
you know, the, the, the treadmill would just be there to hang their clothes on it at home. There was no, no more exercise. And I realized the same thing needs to happen here, where instead of prescribing something, I needed to get curious. I needed to stop teaching and start asking, really inquiring without, you know, any judgment, just absolutely an open kind of soul level. Tell me about this. You know, what is it then? Series of, of questions that the women also had never asked themselves. So you asked how I came to this. That began, you know, a, a whole body of work, a whole body of amazing learning occurred for not only them, but for myself and through the many workshops and trainings and, and sessions since. There's an incredible, vast, fun amount of, of wisdom to share in the next little bit with you of what came out of that inquiry. So that's kind of the, the outer path, how I got here. You know, I was just a perfect storm being a, a dietitian, nutritionist, right on the cusp of the of the birth of eating disorders. But what kept me in the psychological or hooked me to the psychological aspects of this and sent me for further training and counseling was my own inner journey. I had a terrifically stressful anxiety disorder in, in my early 20s. And it was had many, many symptoms. I think on the DSM criterion for anxiety disorders, I had this one and that one and this one and that one. And I was I was sort of paralyzed by the terrorization of it. And I was getting phobic of places I'd had anxiety attacks and I was having them like a bomb raids on, you know, myself. I was having some wonderful therapy. But at one point I remember the distress of feeling like I'm losing my mind and kind of asking it after one anxiety attack, what do you want from me? And it, I've never asked anything of, of myself. Like, I don't know who I thought I was talking to, but I just mm -hmm. asked almost it, you know, what do you want from me? And I meant it. And the next thing I knew it was about an hour later, I got this answer, this, this just, you know, this thought that obviously I thought it, but it, it seemed to come from another part of me from somewhere much deeper. And what that answer was happens to be love me mm. no matter what. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. Really? Yeah. Mm. Much less to get an answer. And, you know, so that, that began an, a self inquiry based process that I did with myself. And I really got well, I'm more than well. I was a wonderful teacher, that anxiety disorder. So I could apply that to my clients with exercise and eating. <laughs> so can, can you start by explaining to our listeners what exercise resistance syndrome is? And then just to kind of give you an idea of where I want to go after this, I would love to hear what some of the questions are that you that you asked of yourself and of women as you developed this area further. Yes, of, of course, I would love to do that. So exercise resistance syndrome is a practice in development. I mean, it's a, it's a theory right now, although it has been such an inspiring process for many, many, many people women in workshops and around colleagues work with women. So it is exercise resistance syndrome is, you know, thought to be a, a syndrome where someone may have enjoyed physical activity in their life and they come to a place where they find themselves unmotivated and unable to shift that motivation there's something about the, the whole inspiration just to be physically active, to do something. Now, obviously, women are overwhelmed and busy, and there are a huge amount of lifestyle issues now, however many years later, we're 35 years later, 
our lifestyle sped up since. So anyone could say, well, I have that. But what separates exercise resistance off is in many, it can actually create a sense of dread or anxiety at the thought of exercise. It can surface as having a response, a really negative response to sweating or hearing oneself breathing, like a somatic, you know, the kinesthetic signs of, of exercise kind of become stressful in and of themselves. Or to many women, it's just the continual quitting of any kind of activity that, that they plan to embark on. The plans last a little while, and then the next thing they know, they're quitting again. So on one side, it can seem like just a lot of starting and, and ending, which can lead to a failure syndrome. And for others, it's just much more a sense of, of dread, like I said. And others, it's a sense of this idea that I'm not athletic. I never was and I never will be. And so it's sort of written off as a belief system. So, you know, what, what's true is that the, the treatment, what I go through with the process works for anyone, whether they have the, quote, syndrome or not, is just exploring our exercise drive. And particularly for women, what affects that drive? So what were some of the questions that, you know, that you, you posed to different women in this process of, of, you know, kind of unpacking what this experience of exercise resistance syndrome is? Yeah. So I just began asking the following questions. And these questions also end up as part of what we do about it, which we can talk about what we do with exercise resistance after the questions. But at first, well, first I, 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 I did tell women to stop trying to exercise. In other words, step one before the questions was, every time you think of exercising, I want you to put your feet up and relax so that you are not exercising with a vengeance. You're sort of, we're going to go into an inquiry process. So we want, you know, you to arrest all the should be doing, you know, quit the gym you're not going to, and just let's go inside. So number one is just stopping. Francie, before you go on, I just have to say that that is so, so counterintuitive, so almost revolutionary. <laughs> really like what that's kind of what goes through me when I hear that and so I can see how this is just you know for a woman who you're working with I mean what kind of how does that affect them to even be told that first off the bat oh it's so it's so amazing the the power of paradoxing you know so we learned with binge eating prescribing the binge food can help people not binge actually being you know, using paradox and being prescribed the foods you're not supposed to have, kind of like, what? And with, so I thought, <laughs> well, I'll try it, right? You know? Right. Just, yeah. So I decided to use paradox and because the should, I should be doing it right now. I should have done it this morning. I should have gotten out. I'm no, 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 is so loud. We can't get into the inquiry. So when I actually say, you're not allowed to exercise, let's just pretend I'm the boss. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they look at me, everybody, there's always <laughs> a fun reaction, then sort of a defiant, well, maybe I want to, you know, so there, there's no doubt about the fact that going into with the rebellion produces a lot of energy is released in, in someone, or a lot of relief, they're, they're they're just so happy to hear, I, I'm going to put my feet up. I don't have to beat myself up. And I think, too, that with that, you know, like you said, there's so much energy that goes into that idea that I need to get to the gym. I'm not working out, you know, that there is. And with that, there's also a lot of shame when you don't. So much shame. There, I, I have such precious, you know, I've had such a precious history with people and I mean, there's one woman who used to take her bathing suit. Her husband was super athletic and he really loved her. But the way he showed that love was to check in on what she did that day and where, when she was going to exercise later and all that. She used to take her bathing suit and wet it in the sink and hang it up on the you know, shower curtain. 
after having driven somewhere and parked her car for a while listening to music while she was supposed to be inside swimming. You know, she wouldn't go Uh, in. Yeah. And she'd just go home and hang up her swimsuit. And he would say, how was the swim? Because there was so much shame. She just said she would lie. It's so often the case where people are going through a lot privately and they're confused about why don't I just do it? Nike app, just do it. Why don't I? So there is a lot of shame um, and judgment on themselves. Yeah. So thank you for going a little deeper into that. If you can go ahead and, and please share some of the questions. Okay. So once people are ready to just put their feet up and, and give themselves a break from exercise, I talk about inquiry is such a key, such a key to our uh, unlocking our own depth and wisdom. Yet we often don't know it. So some of these questions they will have asked themselves in annoyance, like, why didn't I, why did I not exercise yesterday? In sort of a judgmental tone. Instead, we turn everything into a, a real question. So one is, what comes to mind? What is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the, the term exercise? And I just have people in groups and workshops just free write. What comes to mind when you hear exercise? And another question, I mean, there are many, so um, I might just hit a few different categories. Yeah, of course, of course. But, you know, I'll I'll look at a group and say, all right, all of you, let's say I have 10, you know, women that are really, really have exercise resistance in, in whatever way. They've either given up completely or they can't stay with something. Say, so imagine we're all together in a room and we're three years old. And imagine somebody's here taking care of us. But imagine how we would all be if we had things to play on and outdoors to run around, you know, toys, trees, gymnastic stuff, music to dance to, you know, you wouldn't be able to hold any of us down. Now, we'd all be different. Some of us are more likely to be jumping and exploring the environment with our bodies others you know less so dramatically but we're all unselfconsciously moving unless there's been real trauma there and so we look at oh yeah so what happened now these questions are not to bring out just an inner child the questions are to say you have a natural female mammal inside of you, like a dog or your dolphin along the boat, your dog that wants to go on a walk. What happened? So one question then becomes, when did playing change to working out? Or when did playing become exercise? And that Mm. is often best facilitated by having a life map process. So sometimes what we'll do is just get a life map out and draw from birth to now a a map, a a line, a road we've traveled. When on that line did did playing change? And some it's competitive sports and, oh, I began, you know, Sports. So when did playing become sports and when did sports become a workout? You know, so there's different terms that bring up different kind of ways of being with exercise. And then I have people notice what happened during puberty as your body changed. What happened with your physical activity through that transformation from 9 or 10 years old to 15 years old? And for some, you know, they develop bigger breasts or or their bodies got curvier in ways that moved differently or in ways that they were self-conscious about or ways in which they finally were getting noticed. So suddenly the body can become, instead of a vehicle to play in, it can become now something that's getting, you know, externalized. And that, for better or worse, can very much change what what 
women wanted to do, what they felt comfortable doing, and what's getting noticed, what's getting praised, why, and what has been maybe through some trauma been unsafe. You know, so now sometimes it's through puberty. If there's been sexual abuse, there's a little more potential to either get exercise addiction and sort of conquer the body by over-exercising and trying to have a mastery of kind of numbing out, shutting out, or to just getting invisible, wanting to become more invisible and backing away, or more boyish athletic. It just really depends. So that leads to the question of, you know, how is exercise related to sexuality in your life? No, that's a whopper. That's a workshop right there, you know. Right. I was just sitting here taking in that question and just to even, you know, sit with it and what it means and what the answers are. That's huge. Right. Right. I mean, people coming out as gay or having, you know, transgender issues and or being heterosexual, whatever, the physical body, you know, is the um, central site, you know, it's home base for our sexuality. And so exercise or working out or being active because it's sold for at least heterosexual women, exercise is sold as the thing to do to get the body, to get the guy. It's sold, you know, all across every, you know, magazine we can imagine in our minds right now. And social media as the way, you know, to the glass slipper for the Cinderella story, you know. It's like the way to be, to be of value in the world. Exactly. Totally. Right. Right. Never mind a competitive sport. So that's another genre. So then I will ask a question about, has anyone been an elite athlete, a gymnast, a you know, dancer or, or elite soccer player anywhere where the physical body pre and post puberty, the size and shape and function matter. And, and second to that are the coaches or over-involved parents or over-involved adults who appropriate the exercise life of that child or teen and make it about them or make it about their talent it gets very confusing after intense elite athletic lives for some, of course, not all, there can be an incredible resistance to exercising and the whole thing just goes in into a box and it's locked up and people can't figure out what happened. Well, there, there can be a lot of emotional and physical and sometimes sexual abuse that occurs in elite athletes or people who, you know, had very strong coaching figures, whoever they were. So that's another, that's another whole area that can, can be explored. And and again, all of this is getting asked not to pathologize and feel sorry for ourselves and certainly yes, compassion for ourselves, but to unlock the story behind what is eclipsing our exercise drive. And the biggest one of all, you know, eclipsing our exercise drive is, was there ever the question, did you ever exercise as a, you know, form of of losing weight? Did you ever combine diet and exercise? Did you ever exercise to lose weight? So I'm like, well, yeah, who doesn't diet and exercise soup and, you know, sandwich going together? But what we don't realize is that we can tell people, ourselves, you've got to exercise in order to have that body. But whatever it is that's underneath and driving our our being in a physical body, the part of us that's alive in the depths of the feminine soul, that becomes squelched. The inspiration to actually move our bodies like we have done for thousands of years before someone told us to, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when, when a doctor or a, our physical trainer and somebody gives us the advice, you should exercise, women, 
we exercise just fine if we're not told to. Mm. You know, it's sort of insults something very core to us. And so when we tell ourselves we have to eat a certain way to lose weight and we have to exercise so much and we think we're intelligent, motivated, rational people, why don't we just do it? It's because using exercise primarily as a way of losing weight, as an attempt to lose weight, primarily, meaning, you know, people who are active can lose weight if they need to, whatever, but deciding to start an exercise program to lose weight turns out that it's not going to work. It, it's not hooked up to the true central radiating energy being that inspires us to move. It's actually squelched because it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking, you know, we never tell anyone to, you know, make sure you breathe. You exactly. Know, like, right? <laughs> exactly. That's exactly true. In fact, I often will say, you know, with all the calorie counting and how much did I eat today? And, oh, I just blew it because I had that and I didn't have that and I need to have. If we thought about breathing as much as we kind of think about how many calories does this machine actually lie? Machines in the gym don't tell the truth about <laughs> how much is it saying I burn now? How much did I have for lunch? If we thought about breathing, like, hey, you're a better person if you breathe fewer times a day. <laughs> like, yeah. If you breathe 2,472 times, you're really in the, you know, then we're, you know, we're, we'd be half out of our minds, which we almost are. Yeah. With all of this. So it's yeah. just fascinating. You know, what comes to mind to me right now is, you know, we've almost gone to the extreme of trying to turn, I guess, the, our physiques because really, I think a big, big part of it, of course, people want to be healthy, but a big part of it is the visual. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to look a certain way and be perceived a certain way. You know, we, we now have people wearing Fitbits. You know, you have apps to monitor your caloric intake and how much cardio do you need to do because you just ate two pieces of pie at Thanksgiving dinner. There's a lot of anxiety around all of this. It's like a Mm -hmm. You know, when I think of clients who are struggling in this area, and sometimes it's it's not primarily they don't they don't feel that it is the concern. They think that this is actually healthy, <laughs> you know. Right. And so it's very difficult. You know what, what you know what? Oh yeah. What's wrong with wanting to work out every day and do cardio and do weights and watch my calories and eat paleo and do gluten free and and it can actually pull you more into that illusion because. On the surface, it seems like it's very healthy and society kind of rewards you for that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely true. So it's, it's like when I started out in the, in the 1980s, you know, it, it was, it's like watching a culture slowly go mad mm. without any judgment, you know, about any one person. It's just like watching the dieting industry somewhat, you know, the fitness and diet industry, the advertising industry, certainly marketing a body and, an, and a health as an image in such a way that it pulled us from our inner lives, living as beings in an earth suit. You see, we, when thousands of years ago, we lived in our earth suits, we didn't have scales. We didn't have mirrors. We didn't have photographs. We didn't have, never mind social media. We lived from the inside out. If we can just imagine waking up and we attuned to the way the angle of the sun might have been falling on our bodies, the sense of temperature. We attuned to, you know, like, like animals bristling in the, in the air outside to our, our, Earth suit, our inner, inner mammal self in these bodies as vehicles to hunt in, run in, dance in, play in, make love in. We live from the inside out. So once we started getting even mirrors, we can see that the, the part of ourselves that gets accessed when we look in a mirror, what part of ourself comes out when we look in a mirror? It's the critic. And so 
with the ability to weigh ourselves and body fat measure ourselves and look in the mirror at ourselves. And now so many photographs on social media constantly reflecting an outer self to ourselves. Yeah. We've moved out of our bodies. And, and so that it becomes also like you're following a recipe for, for um, mm-hmm. what we perceive as health, what we perceive as beauty, what we perceive will get us approval, acceptance, and love. Right. Yeah. And you know what? There's, there's no doubt about the fact. Sure, I feel better when I get you know, my hair done or having an external, enjoying and having an external presence, you know, deciding to go for a certain style and is, is fun. But like you're saying, we've abandoned our, our own knowing of what it's like to have the pleasure, the honor and the pleasure of living in our skin. And it is really a challenge at this time in the world to decide I am going to own this gosh darn body at the size and shape it is. I'm going to climb back inside and I'm going to move it. We will talk about after the questions, what do you do? But if people go through the whole process, they get to reclaim something they didn't even know they left. They didn't even know they had, which is an, an inner soul, a feminine soul that lives inside any body. And we're going to go find that. Oh, it's beautiful, Francie. Mm. Before we move into the, you know, how to approach healing, I'm curious about what are some of the, I guess, what surprised you or what are some of the responses that really stood out for you in the years that you've been asking these questions? Right. Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, I'll tell you, this was a, an introduction to really what is Jungian depth psychology? Because the answers that came out, and hence I, I went and did a lot of work with Marion Woodman and how I know Anita Johnson and metaphor work was due to the answers. Because first of all, when people answer, you know, what comes to mind when you hear the word exercise, you know, it's pretty negative. And for me, that, that wasn't, it wasn't negative. So it was nice to see, oh my gosh, this is association to that word is pretty bad. And why? Or because the answers that came out were really the majority of the women I was treating had, because they were struggling with eating issues, overeating, undereating, bulimia, every version. They were exercising in an effort to change their body shape and weight. And they couldn't figure out why that wasn't working because they were really driven people. So if they weren't over exercising, but there often just was a point at which their psyches refused after being a marathon runner to even get up and get out the door at all. So they, their answers were really that the part of them, the part of us that tells us what to do is in one part of our psyche. Look, we need to do this exercise. We need to not eat that food. The part of us that won't move, it's like, or wants to binge and binges, is in another department inside our psyche. They're not connecting. They're not talking, right? (laughs) Yeah, they each have their own agenda. (laughs) They each have their own agenda. Yeah. And I'll tell you, they're, yeah, the the feminine principle, which is loves moving. And, uh, you know, so that's another long story, but. The feminine principle that is creative and chaotic and alive and fierce, like the she-wolf, Clarissa Estes talks about in Women Who Run With the Wolves. I love her work. Oh my God, I love her work. (laughs) She says we're all, you know, we're women, are wolves. You know, we, we, we belong to a pack. We will support each other. And we're we're mammals and our tail falls outside of our, you know, hemline of our dress on our way to church. We try to tuck it in, but every now and then it sneaks out. <laughs> well, with, with exercise answers that were coming through, women were finding themselves saying, I don't want that whoever, husband, coach, physical trainer, to tell me what to do one more time. I don't want to hear my dad 
commenting on, you know, just in passing women's body shapes. I don't want to exercise when it means I'm a colluding somehow with that standard that women should because they're supposed to look a certain way for men. There was a buried, smoldering, living refusal to to cooperate in, in a system that they on a surface would say, oh, it's not a problem for me. You know, I don't mind, you know, when he sa- says that. But out of the questions came answers like, basically, don't tell me what to do. Mm. Don't tell me what to eat or what to wear when I go here, what to do with movement. It's my body. It's my life. Bug off. So I think women were surprised also by the way they had allowed themselves in a way to be kind of exploited or appropriated through puberty and with their sexuality. And that opened a huge body of soul work when women got into the issue of, of sexuality and you know, certainly with the transition through puberty, our lack of, lack of rite of passage. And what emerged out of that was that we have had a collective feminine soul psyche that has lived within this body we've had and that, that we inherit uh, a collective wisdom and knowing and that in that our sexuality is sacred, not the purified, whitewashed sacred. It's ours and it's deep and it's powerful. And most of us don't learn how to, you know, ride that, how to even be in our full sexuality. And it's very tied to exercise because underneath you pull apart the the source of exercise resistance or even exercise addiction. There are issues of intimacy and safety. And mm-hmm. not only that, just wanting to really own this body of ours and, and what comes with it, the, the collective, inherited, beautiful soul we are. So one of the things that stood out for me as you were sharing this too is that within this refusal of the body of this or the psyche saying no is a desire to to no longer be part of the collusion, to be able to be authentic in that, and then also an expression of the anger and the sadness about that loss. Yes. So no doubt about there is a phase of such, you know, deep aha. First of all, the questions really do reveal so much sanity underneath what looks like laziness the mis- the judging oneself is lazy or unathletic by the way everyone's athletic it's just a matter of how you know we are naturally as mammals we move and so there's such an aha and then there's such a deep you know process sometimes of of empowerment and grief and anger so certainly the range of emotions there is outrage and new boundaries people find. So Francie, there's so much to this topic and I, you know, we, we just don't have enough time to really fully sure. delve into all the beauty and, and, and wisdom that you have to share. But I do want to touch on, you know, what, what are some of the ways that women can begin to heal, uh, to recover, to, to make the, the meaningful shifts? Well, number one, I think, is to trust themselves. I think if we all knew the, like, I had no idea the resource that was in myself when it came to finally putting the the real turning point in my own anxiety disorder, I really do believe that with the right inquiry process, we, we, we have a lot of wisdom. So for people just to trust that if they're not getting to the gym, and it may just be the wrong kind of exercise, but certainly to trust themselves and begin to really ask themselves what it is they want and need. And certainly we can talk about contacting me for some of the inquiry questions and process. But number two is 
you know, after integrating their own, your own answers to some of these questions, then it starts to become an issue of deciding, do I want to be, do I want to claim the being that I am that, that naturally would, would love to move that, you know, do I want to reclaim that part of myself and how do I do that? Does that answer your question? So people then go through a, a reclaim. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, because the reclaiming seems to be making this choice on their terms versus and being very clear on why they're doing it, being very honest about it versus trying to go to the gym because their doctor said it would be good for them to get some cardio in. Exactly. And, and, and by the way, sometimes, you know, the gym isn't going to be the place, but, but definitely coming at the idea of reclaiming one's own, you know, physically active, moving presence in there, you know, and then kind of re-envisioning, well, what do I, what do I even like doing? What would I um, like? What do I think I like doing? You know, so there's this whole re-envisioning visualization process. Um, and only at the very end do we say, okay, you can move now. Let's explore doing this with a lot of attention to the subtle body. Somatic therapies, by the way, are always really wonderful in this whole process. There's a lot there. But in the end, there's a wedding, a claiming, a ceremony, a ritual, a decision that get made. And it's with in one's own terms, you know, understanding now what the blocks have been, then it's a, it's a celebration. And many times these rituals are very celebratory. And then somebody just is good to have a, a, a coach or a support person to, to kind of follow up with. But certainly rethinking the gym as a place to that necessarily go, especially the machines. Yes, the gym can be a fabulous place if there's music and life there. But thinking about really rethinking dancing. I mean, most of the women I give workshops all the time and the the dancing that just naturally happens in women of all sizes, shapes, ages is, you know, it's inherent in our in our makeup. It's in our DNA. So thinking about combining an indoor and an outdoor option, just thinking outside the box and putting together a plan and never, ever pressuring oneself to like exercise every day. That's ridiculous. So really part of this then, Francie, is it involves being very aware of and seeing that pursuing exercise because the goal is weight loss is actually going to be it's not going to work. Correct. Because that whole aspect of this has to shift. Right. It, it's moving your body because it's pleasurable because your body instinctively wants to move. Exactly. It It is, and it will be. It takes sometimes a month or two, by the way, to get it to be pleasurable. But in the end, you can, a person can get lose weight or, or, you know, certainly there's more tone or their body shape might adjust after exercising, no doubt about it. But the real reason one is getting out and and doing whatever makes them feel alive is is the inherent pleasure in the, in the well being that may follow exercise and eventually the well being that happens during it, doing it, enjoying it. So it's not always about the physical effect that then it will be sustainable. And Francie, I want to go back to, you mentioned it really briefly, but I know that not all our listeners are familiar with this. And you talked about the divine marriage. And when I hear that, and of course, I, you know, I, I also have a, a background in Jungian or depth psychology. I'm thinking of, you know, this commitment to our, to, to ourselves, an inner commitment, a promise, a sacred promise. Yes. Could you describe that briefly for our listeners? What, what does that mean in the context of healing from exercise resistance syndrome? Great question. So what it means is it's a decision, consciously made decision after going through the inquiry questions, after really feeling through the answers and really now understanding oneself in a much broader context and understanding one's soul, then, then it becomes, there's an opening 
to reclaim the natural birthright, which is our, our ability to move our bodies and live in an active body at times and to feel the well-being that follows that. And so a person is invited to make a decision to live in their bodies, inhabit the skin, our, our earth suit, to actually inhabit it and to reconsider committing to living from that inner body out through physical activity as one. This, this divine marriage could occur in many, on many levels, but this one being about moving the body, it would be, it's a commitment that ends up, I'll give you a couple of examples demonst- that might demonstrate this. So it's, it's a marriage between the, the self now and that inner being that got left behind, the inner mover, the one who would naturally dance under the moon if we were in a tribe several thousand years ago. We wouldn't have to say, oh, you're going to burn 500 calories tonight dancing around the fire. You know, it was a soul thing. We do it for deeply pleasurable, important reasons. So in reclaiming that part of ourselves, it's kind of, it's like a walking up the aisle, right? With the inner being that loved to move that got silenced or put away and the person you are now. And so with, with one woman, I remember that she, her husband had died and they'd walked on the beach all the time, every day. It was their ritual. And after he died, she could not imagine walking on the beach. So it didn't walk at all, you know? And finally, after our work together, it became clear it was time for her. So she went out to the water, to the beach and, and her ritual was simple. She just drew a line in the sand and she stood on that line in the sand, you know, like she was going to step across the line in, in a decision, in a marriage to her herself as a being alone, even though she believed he was spiritually around, to continue on, to take the next step in her life and to continue on. And so she created a ritual of stepping across that line, which was a sacred decision to go on as, as an individual woman in a marriage to herself. That's a beautiful story, mm. Francie. It's very touching to be a part of that. And then, Francie, just to, to, to wrap things up, you've touched on, on one of these already, but what are some of the myths and misperceptions surrounding exercise resistance syndrome? Well, I can imagine myself probably even hearing about uh, that name and thinking, <laughs> Oh my gosh, do they have to pathologize everything? Right. So, <laughs> right. You know, the first reaction is, you know, especially from the masculine principle, whether it's in a man or a woman, is just, oh, geez, just shut up, stop whining. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, right. It's actually, hopefully, clearer now that it's just a very precious reclaiming. And it's not about pathologizing. It doesn't really matter if someone has the syndrome or not so much as do the, would an inquiry process help unveil more of the inspiration to move and be actively alive than a person feels they have now? So that, I think, one misconception would be just a, a ridiculous pathologizing where there really is actually a lot of beautiful work can happen here. I think second is just the idea that we could tell a woman what to eat or what to do or how to move or that she should exercise and expect that to actually work. I think the, the myth that we can tell ourselves with an authoritative tone much about eating and exercise and, and, and not understand that we are wild as one of your other podcast speakers shared you know, we are wild and we're rebellious yeah. and we will do whatever the heck we end up really wanting to. So we have to work on that level with ourselves. Who's in there and what does she want? Not just the rational yeah. solution-based. Yeah. Yeah. That was Dr. Marilyn Steele. But yeah. She talked about the wild feminine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Francie, what is the best way for the audience to 
to contact you, learn more about you, and you know if they'd like to work with you? Yes, I have a website that will be up and running by then. Just just got this one. And that is going to be my name, Francie White. So www.francie white, W-H-I-T-E dot com. And can you share any of your resources, services, products? Or I, I know you have a wonderful gift that the audience can take advantage of. Yes. Wonderful gift they can take advantage of. Absolutely. And anyone can email me at Francie White the number two at gmail.com as well. And then I have workshops scheduled for both clients tending the soul and for training professional women. They're all women called tending the feminine psyche where I do trainings on many aspects of depth, union psychology alongside with Anita Johnston. We do a lot of myth work as well as didactic and process work with exercise resistance and eating, disordered eating. I also do one-on-one individual work with helping people through the inquiry process and throughout the integration and, and total healing process. And I have a boatload of written resources. So those were a few starters. That's a lot. So much rich information for our listeners. And Francie, could you share a little bit about what the, what listeners can find in the ebook that you are so generously offering our listeners? Yes, I'm going to be releasing the Reader's Digest version of the ebook. Okay, <laughs> okay. so yeah. it's individuals who want to just sort of power through and get the major, you know, golden nuggets that are in a in a condensed version that can be you can use on yourself with yourself or as a professional if you want to with your own groups or others that should be able to be enough to get you through and i'm happy to release that and to have people you know make it personal for themselves and do what what really they feel and led to do with it so and francie we will put links to your website along with all the information that you shared and the resources so that listeners can can find you and learn more about your work and get some support. Thank you so much. Just wonderful to have the opportunity to be here on your program. It's a beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Francie. It is an honor, and I am so grateful that we had this conversation so that women can begin to have a different experience of their bodies and begin to you know, first of all, get an understanding of why they may be struggling in this area and and how that can shift. And I feel that this is so timely and so needed right now. So thank you for the important work that you're doing in the world. You are so welcome. Thank you. And may everyone just get to enjoy these bodies, yeah. inhabiting them, right? <laughs> right. It's <laughs> quite a journey. All right. Okay. Take gentle care. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Francie. One of the things that grabbed my attention was when she spoke about the power of paradoxing, especially in the first step of the healing process, which is to stop all efforts to exercise. That really kind of blew me away, and it was really helpful to hear her explain why this step is so critical, why it's so powerful. I also loved how Francie described how exercise resistance develops and all of the factors that play into this, all of which lead us further away from our center, from our deep intuitive knowing of our bodies and the natural state of being in our bodies. I also really loved how Francie shared some of the inquiry questions that she uses in her work with women questions we can ask ourselves that are the first steps in shifting our experience and relationship with our bodies. If you enjoyed today's episode with Francie, please check out episode 67, which talks about the top six women in depth podcasts for binge and emotional eating. Dr. Anita Johnston is featured in episode 59 on cracking the hunger code through storytelling and metaphor. 
And if you wanted to listen to the episode that Francie mentioned with Dr. Marilyn Steele, that's episode number 39, Soul Song, Awakening the Wild Feminine. For show notes to today's episode and links to all of the resources mentioned, including Francie's free condensed version of her ebook with the inquiry questions and recovery guide to exercise resistance syndrome, please visit www. LordesViado.com forward slash women in depth. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe on iTunes or share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.